Brownsville, Texas, February 1860. They come from Austin and San Antonio, from Galveston and Houston, bringing their guns at the orders of their leader, George W. Bickley. Meeting at the Rio Grande, these men exchange secret handshakes and passwords. Learning who is a Knight of the Iron Hand or a Knight of the True Faith, solidifying their roles for the expedition. For soon, they will invade Mexico and conquer it, completing the first step in a plan to create a new empire greater than Rome. A super state stretching from Virginia to Belize, a lucrative ring of Americanized states who will preserve slavery forever. The Knights of the Golden Circle are ready for war. I mean, kinda. Thanks so much to Ground News for sponsoring today's historical tale. Welcome back, Adept. Are you ready to continue your journey and advance to a higher circle of knowledge? Because if so, you'll be granted the rank of Quill Bearer in the Ordo Extra Historia! <laughs> Sorry, that never gets old for me. This week, we will unveil to you the Knights of the Golden Circle, a secret organization that tried to create a terrible New World Order in the years leading up to the American Civil War. Now, to anyone who'd had dealings with him, it was generally known that its leader, George W. Bickley, wasn't really a man to be trusted. His checkered work history had included stints as a journalist, quack doctor, and shadiest of all, an amateur historian and novelist. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. But that history didn't seem to faze anyone when on July 4th, 1854, he and a group of companions in Lexington, Kentucky, formed the Knights of the Golden Circle, an organization whose goal was as ambitious as it was grandiose. Bickley's plan was to found a vast transnational empire, a golden circle of slavery that would stretch from the southern United States through Mexico and across the Caribbean to the northern coast of South America. This, he thought, would ensure slavery could never be abolished and geographically link the southern United States with the Empire of Brazil, which at the time was the only other slave nation in the Americas. Then they would reshape Latin America, reorganizing its economy along the southern plantation model, and Americanize that culture. But how to do it? Through filibustering. No, not that filibustering you might be thinking about, a 19th century phenomenon, best described as sort of private colonialism, where small groups would invade Latin American countries and try to take over the government. This almost always went predictably badly, yet somehow Bickley's ideas found support. Part of that was most likely out of desperation, though. It was clear by the 1850s that American slavery faced determined opposition and might eventually be abolished or phased out. But add Mexico to the South as one or more states, Bickley reasoned, and pro-slavery states would have a permanent majority. Moreover, should they expand further, these slave states could control much of the world's production of high-priced commodities like sugar, molasses, tobacco, cotton, coffee, and rice. And of course, it would own the human labor that produced them as well. For a capital, Bickley picked Cuba, the port that received most of the enslaved people entering the Americas. Yet this plan could not be revealed openly, so Bickley formed a secret society. And I'll give you three guesses on what he modeled it after. Did you guess the Freemasons? Oh, all three times. Well, three gold stars for you, because that's what he did. Pulling a little bit of Adam Weist help, he set up an organization that had castles rather than lodges, with three degrees of membership, each with progressively higher fees, and each order had a foreign and home section, based on whether they'd join a future expedition or provide support. Most members entered the military order, the Knights of the Iron Hand, intended literally to be used as the order's foot soldiers. Cost of membership, one dollar. Above that was the Financial Order, or Knights of the True Faith. They were the purchasing agents, doctors, clergymen, newspaper editors, and diplomats. You know, anyone who'd settle and run the new land or supply armies. Cost of membership, five dollars. And then at the top, there were the Knights of the Columbian Star. The select few leaders who governed the organization and would govern any territory conquered. Their identities were secret, even from most of the order. And what might that rank cost? Ten dollars. All of this, including the filibustering plans, laid cloaked behind layers of ritual and arcane codes, passwords, and handshakes. All Southerners of good character could apply, and even Northerners living in the South provided it was clear their sympathies lie with the expansion of slavery. 
And in truth, there were many of both. Because while Bickley's organization had stayed small for the first few years, in 1859, there was a membership explosion. By then, the anti-slavery Republican Party was clearly on the upswing as a political force. And in October, John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, which you can see our series on here, shook this organization so badly that defending against similar efforts made it into the Order's vows. Meanwhile, a costly civil conflict called the Reform War had carved up Mexico between political factions. So feeling that the time was at hand, Bickley stormed the South on a lecture tour to find new recruits. Castles sprang up in major cities across the South, all standing at the ready to grab their guns and head toward the border. And that spring, he sent out the call to muster. Well, actually, it was more like spring-ish. See, all those new castles made communication difficult. And some, like those in Texas, were closer to the border than those, say, in Maryland. However, the truth really was, Bickley had spent a lot more time creating secret handshakes than he had establishing timetables and communication lines, so the result was chaos. The muster point was Brownsville, Texas, across from Matamoros, Mexico. Now, Matamoros held vital port facilities, making it a good target, and many knights were familiar with it from the Mexican-American War. The Texas knights arrived in February and March, making camp waiting for Bickley's army. Meanwhile, the northernmost castles were telling their members it'd be weeks before they went south. Basically, George Bickley threw an invasion, and nobody came. Eventually, the 400 knights at the border disbanded and went home. And y'all, they were furious. Yet at that time, no one could find Bickley. Turns out, he'd gone to Alabama and Georgia on a last-minute fundraising trip, but in his absence, rumors grew that he'd fled with the treasury. By the time he'd returned to the Order's stronghold of New Orleans, the city's 1,000 members had turned into an unruly, frothing mob. Angry at the lack of planning and money, they'd run articles in the local newspaper denouncing Bickley, calling him an imposter, a liar, a coward, and a confidence man. Knights from Texas came in to review the organization's books. Then that May, the organization held a convention in Raleigh, North Carolina, to examine the expedition's failure. The conclusions cleared Bickley of wrongdoing, elected him permanent president, and instituted three reforms to make the next expedition successful. First, they revised their ceremonies. Gotta get those dabs dialed in, baby. Very important. Second, they shook up the administration, appointing an official quartermaster general and paymaster, and moving the headquarters to Knoxville, Tennessee, for a six-month period, by which time, you know, Mexico would be conquered and the capital relocated there. Good plan, very realistic. And third, they publicized their plans to attract more money and manpower. Their ranks swelled once again, and by October, newspapers reported that a new expedition was coming. Members were mobilizing, secret passcodes being exchanged. A liberal Mexican governor was, supposedly, even in support of the plan. Bickley and his scheme was in the spotlight now. They had the men. They had the organization. Knights, rally south. It will not go like last time. It went exactly like last time. A few hundred Texans gathered at the Rio Grande, realized no one else was coming, and went home. See, Bickley never really created a detailed plan or solved the supply or communications issues. Yeah, turns out he wasn't a general or a shipping expert. He was just some dude. Bickley then tried to drum up interest in a new venture, but Lincoln's wins and the establishment of the Confederacy stole his thunder. And with the Union blockading its ports, Mexico, and specifically Matamoros, which Bickley had planned to attack, became the Confederacy's only route for exporting cotton, and no one wanted to kill that golden goose. Soon, even Bickley lost interest, resigned, and joined the Confederate Army as a doctor. Then, taking a trip north on leave, he was immediately arrested as a spy and spent the war in federal custody. The order itself reorganized as the American Knights in 1863. Which is not to say that the Knights had no impact on history. During the secession crisis, Knights in Texas rallied as militias in San Antonio, where a contingent of 150 joined an armed standoff, helping force the federal commander to surrender the Alamo and the city's military plaza. Many of those Texas KGC companies then mustered into the Confederate Army, playing major roles in both seizing federal property and the Confederate invasion of the Southwest. A plan so optimistic and so poorly planned that it would really do George Bickley proud. Some still would, in a way, live out Bickley's vision after the war, where they resettled in Brazil, trading Southern American enclaves in the jungle, where they could still own human beings. 
And there you have it, Quillbearer. You have achieved this new knowledge well. But let me ask you something real quick. What do you think you'll do if the subject is a little more magical? Well, if you join our conclave next time, we'll be diving into the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And if you listen carefully enough, you might even attain the rank of Helios, which everyone in the inner circle knows is the most well-informed rank of our order. But what is their secret, you ask, to gaining this worldly knowledge and deep understanding of its various origins? Well, that would be the ever-updating texts of Ground News. I love Ground News, because rather than getting conflicting information and sensationalized coverage from my seemingly endless social media feed, now I get my news from somewhere I'm way more confident I can find the whole story. And that's because Ground News shows you exactly how news stories are being covered and compares the ways different news organizations cover the same topics from all across across the political spectrum, which I find super helpful when I'm trying to analyze news stories that my kind of out there Uncle Kevin keeps sharing with me. Stop it, Kevin! And that is due to their awesome bias distribution chart, where you can see all sorts of information about the various media outlets you get your news from. Everything from factual accuracy to political leaning to who actually owns said media outlet, that one I always find particularly interesting, all in one easy to read location to help you spot media bias and better understand your own reading habits. For instance, I just saw a story about how a man who used a megaphone to lead an attack on police during the January 6th riot got seven years in prison. And I could see the bias, compare headlines, and the total number of reporting sources. Huh. You know, I would have thought that an attack on police would have gotten a bit more coverage on the right. Plus, they have a blind spot feed that lets you check out news from beyond your regular haunts, a headline comparison feature, and even a weird news newsletter, which is just a super fun way to keep up on the more out there stories of the week. So if you are looking for a great way to stay informed and a better tool to think critically about your news, you should definitely give Ground News a try by heading to ground.news slash extra credits or via the link in the description where you can get 40% off their Vantage subscription, which gives you unlimited access to all of their amazing features for only five bucks a month. ka -ching. Again, get a way better news feed right here. And then once you're in the know, why not check out another of our videos here? Say, did you hear the one about Kuya Koi, Joseph Blame, Izzy Coin, Ilkner, Dominic Valenciana, Arclight Games, Angelo Valenciana, and Ahmed Ziad Turk being legendary patrons? Yeah, turns out they're the best.